On this episode of This Week in Linux, there were a ton of new releases this week. Ubuntu and all the Ubuntu flavors released 18.10. New versions of Elementary OS and Pop! OS were also released this week. We also saw new releases from Ubuntu Touch, Lightworks, Turtle, PeerTube, and many more. Later in the show, we'll talk about the libssh vulnerability that was r- discovered recently. And we'll talk about the latest olive branch from Microsoft. All that and much more coming up. I'm Michael Tanell with Tux Digital, and this is your weekly source for Linux good news. Up first in the show this week is naturally going to be the biggest news of the week, and that is Ubuntu 18.10 has been released, as well as all the Ubuntu flavors. So this is the Cosmic Cuttlefish uh, 18.10 release, and the there's there's a lot of things that have been changed in the regular proper Ubuntu, but the most changes are in the flavors, and we'll get to that in a second. But first up, the, re- the proper Ubuntu has a brand new theme for the update of GNOME 3.30. They have the new Yaru theme, which is really nice because the theme for the desktop environment of regardless of which one they were using hasn't really changed like in like seven years or maybe five years or something like that uh, so it's it's nice t- it's, it's about time for an update so i'm glad that they have decided to do that they've also added a lot more integration with snaps in the software store as well as added a fingerprint scanner which is interesting um support for a fingerprint scanner if you have one i mean they've also updated the kernel to 4.18 which is the current kernel as of this release. And uh, they've also added a lot more support for uh, the Vega graphics and stuff like that. So they've they've done quite a lot, but I think the most differences in the release for 18.10 has to go to Lubuntu, which has re- replaced the LXDE desktop environment with the LXQt desktop environment, as well as introduced uh, Compton, as the compositor for the system to make it much more like enhanced visuals and a much more polished experience. So if you're if you haven't seen it on the channel, I made a see what's new video for Lubuntu 18.10, and I, you can see a lot more th- like all the specific things that have changed with the new release in that particular video. So instead of going like reiterating it here, you can just go check out the link in the video description and in the show notes for that to to see what's all different in Lubuntu. Next up in the Ubuntu flavors release is Ubuntu 18.10, which has a lot of uh, iterative changes, but it also has a few big changes as well, introducing the Plasma 5.13.5 version to Ubuntu. Uh, they've injured, they've they added support with Snap integration with Plasma Discover, and they're using the 5.11 Qt toolkit. Now, you may be wondering, you know, 5.14 was just released. Is Ubuntu going to be getting that you know, that version in, uh, in Kubuntu? And the answer to that is, by default, no, but you can use the Plasma 5.14 in the Kubuntu backports already. So if you would like to use 5.14, you can just activate the backports and then do an upgrade, and it will start using 5.14 at that point. So if you would like to use the more stable version of 5.13, you can, but the 5.14 is also available. And also, Zubuntu has an update with 18.10, and there's a lot of things that are interesting about Zubuntu. One of those is that they have done a lot of under the like updating of the components to 4.13 development versions of different packages, making the Zubuntu release like more closer to a GTK3 only desktop. There's still there's still some GTK2 stuff, um, but it's it's nice to see that there's going to be there's being there's being so much updates to the core that they they I mean they kind of like XFC is known for not releasing very quickly so it's possible it's likely that the next version of like 4.4 uh, 4.14 for xfc won't release this year and if that's the case then it's it's a really good idea that they were to go ahead and like put in the newer version so they could have a much better you know offering for their just for the ubuntu distribution uh, they've also added an updated version of the elementary xfce icon theme to 0.13 which introduces the manila folders that the elementary os distro was using They've also updated Greybird theme, which makes it a nice, you know, they've cleaned up the, the design of the interfaces and the wind and the windows and everything like that. So it's a really nice upgrade. And if you're interested, you can find a link to that in the show notes below, as well as the Kubuntu release. Up next in the show is Ubuntu Studio 18.10. 
Ubuntu Studio is one of the other flavors that has a lot of changes happening. And one of those is the specifically we're going to talk about it just a couple, but I wanted but I'm actually going to get a representative from Ubuntu Studio to do like a quick interview uh, towards the end of this particular segment. So I'll switch to that when I get done with a couple of these things. But they've added some configuration tools for Jack, and they've made it possible to automatically detect hot plugged USB audio devices as well as being able to use more than one audio device at, at a time through Jack which is, the, I think, the first time that any, anybody's ever done that with like a, a GUI tool for Jack. So that's very cool. They have also are working on the possibility of making it possible to install... Um, I just said the possibility of making it possible. That Anyway, making it possible to add the Ubuntu Studio package on top of existing Ubuntu flavors. So instead of saying like you have to use Ubuntu Studio with the particular XFCE... Uh, desktop environment that they provide, you could may, in the future maybe do Ubuntu Studio as a package on top of another flavor, which I'm really excited for that because that would be fantastic. So let's go ahead and move on and uh, have a little quick interview with Eric from Ubuntu Studio. Joining me this week is Eric Eichmeyer from Ubuntu Studio. Thank you very, very much for joining me, Eric. Absolutely. Anytime. Yep. And uh, you, the Ubuntu Studio 18.10 was just released, and there's a lot of cool things that I'm I'm really wanted to talk to you about. So we have you on the show to discuss that. And first of all, there's a lot of updates to the Jack configuration stuff for the uh, Ubuntu Studio controls. Could you tell us about that? Yes. Yeah, so basically, we've got uh, Ubuntu Studio controls, which has in the past just been a utility to configure your user to be able to use the um, memlock on the audio and uh, be able to configure for the real-time uh, processes. Now, that's we. It, it's been completely rewritten from the ground up because it was one of those things that you ran once and never ran again. You used QJack control for everything else. So what this does is it takes what QJack control does and adds it along with all the user configuration and memory lock configuration items, and also enhances configuration for USB devices. So, okay. for instance, you can have your master device, which is probably your built-in device on either your motherboard or your or a PCI card, mm -hmm. and allows you to also take a USB device that you might have plugged in and quasi make that the master. So Jack treats it as though it's the master, even though there is a PCI built-in uh, card going on. Nice. So it it allows you to do that. So now you've got two items that you can use at once, but it doesn't stop there. There's also a bridge that allows you to, anytime you plug in a USB audio device, it automatically detects that USB audio device. Jack becomes aware of it, and now you can use it to patch into your DAW or other Jack-aware nice. devices or yeah. applications. So yeah. it's the first time we've ever had anything, any Linux GUI that configures Jack to do that. Okay. And it is something we are very excited about yeah we, we i talked about it earlier in the show about that and the 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 first time ever uh that's really cool and because like the the auto jack is probably one of the most uh confusing things in linux i mean it's like the linux audio itself is kind of confusing in some ways to get things to work but when you start playing with jack like to set jack up it's really really uh kind of a, a annoying in a way so it's really nice to have stuff like ubuntu studio that makes it a lot easier especially with like the hot uh, the, like the hot swapping or the hot plugging or things like that um so that's really cool i also noticed that you added uh, some no some uh the pico pixel which i hadn't heard of this application until this release notes and it's like a, a pixel art drawing app so what, what made you decide to add that to mm -hmm. the, the package well there are a couple of things first of all uh we were approached by the developer he kind of came into our chat room and said, hey, I would like to see if you guys wouldn't mind adding this to Ubuntu Studio by default or if we wouldn't mind, uh, you know, I think he eventually emailed us at one point. We're like, yeah, let's look at it. It's already in the repos. So sure, let's, nice. you know, why not? Yeah. Not only that, but we had we had to make room. You know, we had made room for something else to come in because we had to drop my paint from the default install. Right, because of the uh, Which was unfortunate. Conflict, yeah. Yeah, there was a major con there is a major conflict if you try to install GIMP and my paint at the same time currently. Yeah, it just kind of seemed like an, a good idea to have something else in there. It filled a niche that hadn't really been filled before. So we're like, yeah, sure, sounds like a plan. Let's do it. 
Nice. I mean, that's actually when I first saw it, I was like, oh, I want to play with this now because it's like it's pixel art and it just <laughs> I've never seen, I never heard of it before. So it's like, you know, I, I, I do uh, graphics art stuff a lot of the times, too. So like just having an editor specifically for pixel art just seems like a fun thing to have. So I want to check that out mm-hmm. later. Um, the other, one of the main yeah. things that I was really interested in want to talk to you about is the the approach that there's a possibility going to have um, Ubuntu Studio package available for other flavors of Ubuntu that they could once you install Ubuntu of any flavor you could install the Ubuntu Studio package and get Jack and things like that. So could you tell us more about mm-hmm. that? So right now what we have is a package called Ubuntu Studio Installer, and all that does is that gives you. Uh, a menu with all of the meta packages for Ubuntu Studio. But it doesn't go beyond that. It doesn't actually install, for instance, Ubuntu Studio controls. It doesn't install, it doesn't do any configuration for you to help tune your configuration for audio or video playback. So Mm -hmm. what we want to do with this is basically have add Ubuntu Studio controls as a dependency because one of the things we want to do eventually, not only for audio, but also have Wacom tablet support be able to be control configured from Ubuntu Studio controls. So that would help with graphic artists such as yourself. Yeah. And we want that to be a dependency of Ubuntu, Insta- Ubuntu Studio installer. We also want to be able to make sure that Ubuntu Studio installer can add any of those meta packages that you want whenever you want. So you mm-hmm. install this one package, you run it, you click what you want, it installs it, and then um, you run Ubuntu Studio Controls once and it configures all of your Jack things for you. Now, one of the things that we need to also address is the Grub menu where we split out the low latency kernel from anything else. And right now it's it's kind of a weird way of doing it, but we're doing it and we want to kind of refine that Grub menu a little bit. Okay. So that would be something that would also get installed along with a uh, swappiness configuration and the memlock configuration that Ubuntu Studio Controls also does. The idea is, it sounds fantastic. Like the ability to have uh, Ubuntu Studio and uh, ma- uh, making it easy to install Jack and other audio productions and stuff like that for other flavors is uh, like a fantastic concept. And I, I'm, I'm like, super excited about that. And uh, this idea of having the different distributions be- or different flavors being able to use the Ubuntu Studio package is just like, but uh, it has potential amazing uh, effects to the other flavors and it help them, you know, improve the, their audio stack and things like that. So I am mm-hmm. very excited for that stuff. So yes. how that started was actually a really interesting idea. It was supposed to be, we want to be able to offer different desktop environments either at install time or as a separate ISO, and mm-hmm. we decided to go with uh, Kitty e Plasma Naturally. for our first alternative desktop environment. Yeah, it's the best it one. Ended up being uh, more convoluted and more of a pain than we had anticipated, yeah. and we've taken a lot more time than any of us had. So we were just like, okay, let's drop that idea and let's look at perhaps just being a bolt on, and then eventually, you know, making it something that we can have installed at install time, as long as you have a working internet connection with mm-hmm. XFCE still as the default. Nice. So I, that's a, an interesting thing because you, you wanted to do it a different way and then realized that that's not really going to work as far as like, you know, like just technical issues. And then instead mm-hmm. converting it a different way and like going a different approach, you still want to have that ability to make the, the st- Ubuntu Studio packages available to whatever distro or whatever DE that people want to use and then doing it the opposite way so you can make it where you could send it to the other flavors. And that is like a great solution for that that particular you know goal. So I, I applaud you and the team for doing that because that seems like I can't wait to try that out. So, <laughs> okay. So, yeah. uh, th- hopefully by 1904, it, it should be relatively easy to do com- compared to what we were trying to do. <laughs> All right. Sounds great. So, I look forward to 1904. And thanks, thanks for again for coming on the show, Eric. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Michael. Anytime. Up next in the show is Pop OS 18.10 was released. While this is not technically an Ubuntu flavor, it is a derivative based on Ubuntu, and they are releasing very soon in like in conjunction with the 1810 releases of of Ubuntu, or like of just Ubuntu in general. So I think they released on the exact same day. Uh, If not, it was very, very quickly thereafter. 
but a pop os 1810 imp- improves a lot of different things of the like their own features as well as the updates that they've made on top of a, of ubuntu itself but the one of the things that they did was make the pop shop much faster and improve the ui so that they would like stop freezing depending on what you're doing and things like that so that's good they've also improved their installer which they have a custom installer and um, they've they've changed they've fixed a lot of bugs in that particular thing as well as have uh, created their own repository builder uh, using like a debian structure so they have they now host their own repos and they build from their own open source tool so they build a tool that makes their that creates their repo and like generates the packages and things like that and the tool they use to make it is uh, now been open source so other distributions could utilize that if they wanted to which is really interesting that they decided to build their own repo so I'm kind of, I haven't tried pop os actually in a while so I am curious to see what types of packages they're building versus what they're using from ubuntu and things like that so if you're interested you can check that out in the show notes below also um, released this week, which was actually before the release of Ubuntu 18.10 because Elementary OS 5.0 Juno was released, and it is based on the LTS version of Ubuntu, which is 18.04. Now, LTS, the LTS version of Elementary, or is always, I'm sorry, the Elementary releases are always based on the LTS versions of Ubuntu. So while 18.10 is out, there's only nine months of support with 18.10. So if you are not going to continuously update, it makes more sense to build to build your system on top of the LTS, which is what Linux Mint does and Elementary does and um, quite a few others as well. So anyway, what the this release is, is like one of the biggest releases they've had because they've changed a ton and they've introduced a lot of cool uh, concepts, especially the App Center. They said that they have three goals in mind for this release. First, provide a more refined user experience, improve productivity for new and seasoned users alike, and take their development platform to the next level. Now, one of the things they did for their development platform is the App Center makes it possible for developers to get payments to their apps uh, based on the user's um, experience with it. Now, all of these applications are that are even that are a part of the pay system are actually like free to try but when you do updates it will like ask you every time you do an update if you would like to pay for it so if you don't pay for it you don't really you don't have to pay for it but it will like most of these apps anyway it will just consistently ask you every time you update would you like to if you would choose if you choose not to it will not bother you again until the next update so it depends on how much an app updates based on how many times they will ask you if you want to pay for it. If you do pay for it, it will it will not nag you after that at all. So, I'm not really I'm not really saying it's a nagging thing, it's more of a like a reminder because it is a nice way to not re, not be nagging, but at the same time still let you know that this this is a possibility that would be beneficial to, you know, the developers and things like that. So, I think it's a really interesting approach that they're doing, so I look forward to seeing how that turns out with the users and things like that. They've also made up, up, did updates to their photos and music apps, as well as did some icon changes to make the icons uh, more unique in their structure. So, like, um, they wanted to get away from the whole "it looks like Apple" type thing. And at this point, it doesn't really look like Apple all that much anymore. You know, in the beginning when they first made it, it kind of did a lot, but really the only thing that's Apple-like now is the dock at the bottom and the panel at the top. Basically, everything else is not Apple-like. They don't have like the opaque, um, like gradient white-ish panels, and they because they have the the tra- they have the transparent panel, and they use a menu system rather than a dock, like a completely only dock system, and things like that. So it is at this point, it's not really it's Mac-ish, but not really like a Mac clone or anything. So it's really interesting to see what they're, how they're differentiating themselves from previous versions. Anyway, if you'd like to try Elementary OS 5.0 Juno, you can find a link in the show notes. Up next in the show is the new Linux Code of Conduct revisions that are happening. They have announced a big list of different of changes and the like interpretations that they have for the Code of Conduct. So there's uh, quite a few things that have been done since the initial release. They've been uh, Greg Kh announced that they've been working on modifications and stuff in 
private and they're now releasing the information prior to the release of 4.19 to get public opinions of the changes that they've been, they've made. Now there's there are some things that have not been addressed yet, but this this article that I will link in the show notes covers a lot of things that uh, potentially would um, pretty much put people's minds at ease about the the potential negatives that could happen because of that the way they're interpreting it, things like that. So first, they've announced that they're no longer going to be using the tech tech. Uh, the Technical Advisory Board of the Linux Foundation. They're creating their own Code of Conduct Committee, and they're also doing a separate mediator approach where they're taking a uh, ind- an individual not a part of the community for the kernel and uh, putting them in place as a mediator. And that will be... I'm going to butcher this name, I'm sorry. Uh, Mishi Kadreri. Uh, K- yeah. Sorry. Probably butchered. Anyway, uh, Mishi is the legal is a legal director for the Software Freedom Law Center or the SFLC. We talked about them in previous episodes. If you want to check those out, um, they're going to be providing a mediator situation. Uh, they're making a lot of other changes, and there's been other changes that have been suggested uh, that it potentially could be, you know, things that they would be considered. I hope so. Anyway, uh, some of the things they were talking about is re- removing the uh, the list of discrimination discrimination factors like. Uh, the gender-based thing, basically to say that instead of like pinpointing specifics of what you shouldn't be allowed to do and saying that you should be trying to make a harassment-free experience for everyone and then leave it at that because if that way it kind of it covers everyone regardless of, of you know specifics and then there would be less uh, room to manipulate based on you know what is or is not allowed to be done or whatever. So it's it's an interesting thing that if you would like to check out, there's a, a lot more that I didn't cover in this article uh, or the uh, the notes that they published. So if you would like to check that out, that will be a, there will be a link in the show notes. Up next in the show is Ubuntu Touch Over the Air Five. UB Ports announced that Ubuntu Touch Over the OTA Five has been released, which is the fifth over the air upgrade that they have they have released, and it now comes with the base using. Ubuntu 1604. They were using 1504 or 1510. I'm pretty sure it was 1504. But they've upgraded now to 1604, which is great because it means they've got a lot of security uh, and stability improvements through the uh, the LTS release of 1604. Now, that does mean that uh, they have roughly three more years of support for that particular core. Um, so we'll see when they decide to upgrade from there. But I think it's fantastic that they're now using the 1604 base because it it adds a lot of improvements to the underlying system. They have also have decided to switch away from their existing web engine, um, the browser for the web engine, which is uh, Oxide, and they're using a new browser based on Qt Web Engine, which makes it much faster. And they've also added uh, the Qt Automatic Scaling, which allows the developers to write apps using uh, Qt Quick Controls and allows them to use the Kiragami 2 framework, which is based, is uh, developed by KDE, meaning that there's possibility that the applications could work on both the Plasma Mobile platform as well as the uh, Ubuntu Touch UB Ports platform. So if that's the case, that would be fantastic because it means that you could be able to have these cross uh, mobile platform applications so they could be like doing this work one time and having it work on both. And that sounds fantastic. So I, I hope that that's what's going to happen and I uh, look forward to it uh, you know, either way. But there's, Ubuntu Touch has done a lot of updates for this particular release. A friend of the show, Ryan, who's also the co-host for Destination Linux for me, he's actually tried this out tried out the latest uh, over the air five from UB ports. So we talk about that in the latest episode of destination Linux, which is coming out this week. So check that out. And I'll have a link to the show notes in this show notes, whenever we release that episode. So by the time this show releases, that won't be have, that won't have been released yet, but very shortly after like a day or two after that, that will be released. So check that out. Also this week is sway 1.0 beta. Now, there's been people talking about how this has been a release, but it's not really a release. It's just a beta release. What's really cool about this is there's a lot of changes under the hood that improves a ton of stuff throughout the entire like uh, window manager. So if you're not familiar, Sway is a Wayland-based window manager that uses the i3 style. 
Now the i3 window manager is a tiling window manager built on X. And Sway is basically implementing all of what makes i3 great inside of Wayland because the i3 team decided that they didn't want to support Wayland. So Sway is working on that. So it's a drop-in replacement for the i3 window manager. And this release basically has upgraded the compatibility with i3 to technically not 100%, but pretty much 100%. So the i3 gaps, i3 itself, and i3 bar are all like extensively supported. They're, they're, you could say they're 100% compatible, but there are a couple features that are not there, but they were deliberately unsupported because they were not like they were not meant to be used in Wayland. They were like X11 only features and things like that that they didn't want to keep anyway. So it's not like it's basically 100% as far as like the functionality and as far as configs go and things like that, but not completely like, you know, put a little asterisk next to that. But overall, it's pretty much done. But there's a lot of cool things. They've added some, a better support for uh, the lock screen and they've added some more protocols for screen capture, which is really cool. So you can have like video recording and screenshots in it now. So if you'd like to see the whole list of everything that's happened in Sway 1.0, or 1.0 beta currently, you can find a link to those in the show notes. So the next topic in this show is Turtle 0.7. Uh, Turtle is an Evernote alternative. It also provides encryptions uh, by default. So if you wanted to use it to store, like taking notes and saving bookmarks and storing documents and images and things like that, it's what that's what it's for. And it's a free open source tool that allows you to self-host it wherever you want. They also provide a hosted service instance that you could use if you want to, and they are planning on creating a premium version of it in the future, but um, I'm not. they haven't really given any ETA for when that's going to happen. But if you would like, you can just host it yourself and provide your own you know, Evernote alternative. They, the server for this release has been rewritten and now using JavaScript instead of the previous common Lisp language. They also have it where a lot of the internals were rebuilt or re-architectured, making it much easier to use with like a team system. So you could have like, you could share files much more easily, and they've also made it much more fast uh, running as well as more stable. And they've also added a new spaces system. They call it spaces, but it's kind of like a container structure. So you could have like here's your personal information, your personal notes, and your work notes, and things like that to keep it more organized. So if you wanted to do that, you could use that, which would make it much more like, instead of just like a whole catch-all thing, it would make it, you know, compartmentalized so you could uh, organize it much better and cl like categorize things. So uh, Turtle is a really cool self-hosted piece of software. If you are interested in that, you could check it out. And if you're also interested in more uh, self-hosted applications being featured on the show please leave a comment in the uh the comments below uh, or just send an email and uh tweet or whatever and let me know what you think about that so next up is another self-hosted uh, piece of software and that is peertube uh, peertube is an alternative for youtube basically it allows you to self-host your own uh, youtube instance technically and it's not really like a clone but it's a similar approach where you have like um, you have video display and you can link direct, like directly to the, like the files and have comment systems and things like that. A lot of very similar, but what's really cool about it is that it's a, uh, using a, uh, a decentralized federated system. So it allows you to, um, have your own self-hosted system, but also interconnect with other, uh, instances of PeerTube so that people could search for more than just your own content on your instance. So if you activate it with the Fediverse, which is what they call the Federation system, you can um, use it to uh, basically search anywhere else that has a PeerTube instance that also connects to the Fediverse. So like, if you don't want it to connect, you can choose not to, but uh, you can also choose it to do so if you want, which is very cool. Now, one of the things that is fantastic about PeerTube is it has a built-in transcoding system so that you can um, basically upload a particular file and then it will create uh, different versions. So that you upload an HD version, it'll, op it'll create, a, like say you do 1080p, you can make it where it will automatically make a 720p, a 480p, a 360p, and etc. 
for like mobile clients and things like that. So it's a really cool um, piece of software because it provides a lot of the similar functions that YouTube offers, but in a self-hosted environment. Another really cool thing is that if you'd like to, you don't actually have to upload directly to Peertube. You can, but you don't have to. You can actually mirror directly from YouTube, Vimeo, Dailymotion, and many other uh, websites that offer uploading of videos. And then what happens there is that you'll tell the Peertube instance, you know, I want to get it from YouTube, for example. And it will download the video from YouTube, upload it to Peertube, and then do transcoding on top of that. So it's it can do like a lot of automation functionality stuff. It's very cool structure. Now, there's other things that, that it has that are very cool. Some things that are not so cool. Like, for example, I mean, I guess it's good in a way if you would like to support video in portrait mode, you know, like recording it vertically on your phone, like a barbarian, if you wanted to do that, you could, I guess that's good anyway. But another really cool thing is that they have support for Mastodon. So you could like a lot of people would, would assume that having support for Mastodon, Mastodon allows you to use um, peer tube to automatically post to a Mastodon instance. For example, that you would be able to, um, like once you post something, it automatically post to your Mastodon account. But it actually it does do that if you wanted to. But it, what's really cool is that it allows uh, people of the Fediverse or using Mastodon to subscribe to a PeerTube instance or a channel from Mastodon. So they could subscribe to their to this a PeerTube account, and whenever there's a new video being posted to that account, Mastodon will automatically pull that in as if it is a, um, a Mastodon toot or something not ridiculous term. Um, so like a status being posted on Mastodon, it will display it like that. It will display inside of Mastodon. Then if you click on that status, it will show the video in like the, the, the extra column layout. And then you could play directly inside of Mastodon. So you can essentially, uh, you don't have to use an RSS feed. You can just use Mastodon to subscribe to this channel because it's built with the same uh, Fediverse structure which is very cool and it shows the power that using this um, this fa this Fediverse infrastructure could be, you know, could have potential to do a whole lot more. So anyway, if you'd like to check it out, you can find more about PeerTube 1.0 in the show notes. Up next in the show is Lightworks 14.5. This is a video editor, a professional level grade video editor that has um, a lot of interesting features. They've like the latest version of 14 was like the, the one of the biggest updates they've had in a very long time, but this is the the iterative version of that, and they but they've added a lot of cool features as well, like they've added Reaper support, so you can export to Reaper format. So if you wanted to do audio editing through Reaper, you could do that now, which is very cool because Reaper is a one of those um, professional level uh, media production softwares for audio that people really seem to like, and they've also made it for support that they can use Blackmagic RAW files which is very cool. So they've also added support for AC3 audio, and they've added variable rate r frame rate media support. So if you have multiple different types of frame rate for different types of media, you would be able to do, you know, compensate for having different frame rates. And they've also done some user interface improvements and things like that. So if you're interested, you can check it out with the link in the show notes. There is a free version of Lightworks, but it's, 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 it's kind of limited in some ways. Well, the reason I have it in the show is because they they do offer same-day Linux support when they release the Windows and Mac version. They also release the, the Linux version at the same time, which is, you know, I, res I very much appreciate that and respect the, any company that does that kind of thing. Uh, but this particular uh, piece of software is known for being very, you know, used in Hollywood and stuff like that. So it is a very powerful video editor. However, uh, the free version is very limited. I think it maximizes like 720p output. So if you wanted to use it, you'd have to pay for uh, the license for it. They the Lightworks Pro cost uh, $25 per month or $175 per year. But if you wanted to buy like an outright license, like a forever license, you could pay uh, $438. So the more you pay, there are some discounts to it, but it's it's still a pretty pricey piece of software. But so if you would like to get a professional level editor. You could check out Lightworks 14.5 in the show notes. 
Also this week, GNOME 3.32 has announced that they have plans to retire application menus. So they, uh, basically the, the menu that they're referring to, uh, badly named for always, application menu would assume that the menu is a part of the application. It is not. It is a part of the shell. It's the menu from the application placed in the shell. Okay. Anyway, what the so there's a there is a reason why they're getting rid of it now because it wasn't very it wasn't used very much by developers or by users because a lot of people didn't know what it was and the developers didn't know what the purpose for them were before it was but essentially it was like a catch all menu that you could uh, like a developer could put uh, whatever options that they wanted in that menu but you could argue why would they not just put it in the application itself versus that menu and I think that's what kind of led to the, des- the decision to remove it so I think that there are some applications that do utilize the a- the application menu well but not very many so it makes sense for them to decide to like get rid of it and um, kind of put it inside of the application itself rather than having it a part of the shell. I did used to like, there was some, I forgot what it was, but there was uh, a couple applications that I used to use when I was using GNOME that was really nice when they did have the menu because you could use shortcuts to activate the menu. But uh, I do understand that the, the, the reasons why they would want to get rid of it. So if you have any opinion about this, let me know in the comments below. But you can check out the article from Pharonix in the show notes. Up next in the show is a very unfortunate piece of information, and that is there was a vulnerability found in the lib SSH library. Now this this vulnerability is pretty severe. It was it was introduced in 0.6, which was four years ago, and this vulnerability makes it possible to bypass authentication and SSH. Which, yep, defeats the point of SSH. So um, there are quite a few things that are being affected. Uh, there's the, they, it could leave you know thousands of servers open to hackers and has been doing so for the past four years because it's been around for that long. They have released a, 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 a fix. They address the issue in the latest versions of 0.8.4 and 0.7.6. So if you were to use those versions, this vulnerability would be would be solved so definitely upgrade if you haven't it's very important that you do um, but there is another thing to put to point out is that open SSH and github are using um, lib as well open SSH doesn't use lib SSH I'm pretty sure so that's not a, that's not an issue uh, github does use lib SSH but they have a modified version which is not affected by this problem so um, as far as if you're using GitHub to, you know, manage your using SSH through GitHub, you're not going to be affected by that. Um, but there are many, many servers that would be affected, so they need to upgrade as soon as possible. Now, really, what happens is basically what happened is that there's a potential that a hacker or attacker could uh, send a specific message that is being that is being uh, to a server that is ex- expecting another message. So the server could be expecting an authentication request, but if the attacker were to send an authentication success message, it would just let them through without a password or anything. So, yeah, that's a pretty big problem, and thankfully it has been fixed, but if you haven't updated, you're still probably vulnerable, so be sure to, if you run servers of any kind, definitely be sure to upgrade immediately. And finally this week is Microsoft has announced that they would join the Open Invention Network and have offered 60,000 patents, well, more than 60,000 patents, to the members of the OIN. Now, this is kind of like an olive branch to uh, open source in a way with offering these patents to open source projects. Now, what it allows them to do is that if they are a member of the OIN, it allows them to have kind of... um, automatic license to use these patents without being sued. There are some kind of caveats to it. A lot of people are kind of like, want, you know, some people are saying whether this is proving anything about Microsoft, whether they're actually adopting open source or not. And they did the same thing with LOT, the LOT network. They've also uh, joined the LOT network to help them with patents as well. So they, they are kind of showing that they have changed at least somewhat. So that's very good. 
and it's it's going to be uh, interesting to see what happens with this. So it, in an interview with ZeniNet, the uh, Scott Guthrie, the executive vice president for Microsoft's uh, cloud and enterprise group, said that we want to protect open source projects from IP lawsuits. So we're opening our patent portfolio to the OIN. How much this actually does, I, I don't, I'm not really sure. But uh, there are some issues where Microsoft for many, many years has used these kind of proxy companies that are essentially patent trolls themselves. And since announcing this, they're still use, there's reports that those, are, those proxies are still being utilized so that these patents are still being utilized against these companies uh, or against companies in general. Maybe if you're not a part of the OIN, you're not a part of the lot network, they'll still utilize these proxies against you. So that's like, I guess, kind of like, you know, shaking your hand with one and slapping you in the face with the other hand. Because it's like, if you're going to offer this type of um, potential uh, partnership with the open source community, but at the same time, if they're not a part of these particular networks, that they don't get the protection. Like It's kind of like a, you know, a double-edged offering and in my opinion hopefully i'm wrong and hopefully these proxies companies will go away and that microsoft will not be utilizing them anymore but at the moment uh based on some uh information from tech rights they've said that um it's best to you know ask how the oin are going to deal with the microsoft proxies that do currently exist and see you know if they can do something with addressing this particular issue because you know Microsoft has been known for decades to utilize patents as a way to make money for their company so if they're going to change it you know what's the plan to address what they're currently or have been doing in the past so I'm interested to see what goes on with this and if we find any you know updates about this particular topic I will let you know in a future episode but for now if you'd like to look at the article from Tech Rights as well as the article from Microsoft's website. I'll have a link to both of those in the show notes. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on the show, please like that smash button and be sure to subscribe. If you'd like to support the Tux Digital channel, you can do so by contributing via PayPal, Patreon, and many other ways. You can learn more by going to tuxdigital.com slash contribute. Or you can order the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt by going to tuxdigital.com slash Linux Everywhere. Or if you're in Europe, you can go to tuxdigital.com slash EU for shipping inside of Europe. If you'd like some more podcasting goodness from me, then check out the latest episode of Destination Linux. Our co-host Zeb wasn't able to be a part of the episode, but fortunately, Noah Chalaya from the Ask Noah Show and formerly of the Linux Action Show was able to guest host for that episode. So be sure to check that out this coming Wednesday. You can go to destinationlinux.org for ways to subscribe if you haven't already. Just a reminder, this show is live every Saturday, so join us in the live chat room to discuss all the latest Linux news each week. Thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tunnell with Tux Digital, and as always, keep using, learning, and enjoying Linux.